Chapter 17 Moses Arrives with Six Passengers Harriet Tubman had experienced moments of envy when she listened to the story that John Ross had told, heard the warmth in Catherine's voice when she spoke William Henry's name. After they finished talking, she frowned, forcing herself to think of something other than John Tubman and marriages and children and engagements and the tenderness in a man's voice when he spoke of his wife. It was still raining. From the dark, heavy look of the sky, visible through the roof of the fodder house, it would be an all-day rain, Christmas Day, and a Sunday. The beat of the rain against the roof of the fodder house, against its sides, would be their only Christmas greeting. She hoped they wouldn't resent it too much. There were wide chinks in the walls. Through them, she could see the swayback cabin where Daddy, Ben, and Old Rit lived. It looked exactly like the cabin on the Brodus plantation where she was born. A whole roll of these swayback cabins here, too. Smoke kept pouring out of the clay daub chimney, hanging heavy in the air. Old Rit had probably killed her pig and was cooking it for the Christmas dinner. The master gave her a baby pig every year, and she fattened it, saving food from her own plate to feed the pig, so that she could feed her family with a lavish hand on this one day. She'd have pork and sausage and bacon, plenty of food. The boys said that Old Rit was expecting them for dinner. They always spent Christmas Day with her. She had to figure out some way of letting Ben know that she was here, that the boys were with her, and that they needed food. It would never do to let Old Rit know this. She would laugh and shout. Then when she learned, as she certainly would, that the boys were running away, going north, she would try to detain them, would create such an uproar that the entire quarter would know their secret. Harriet remembered the two men, John Chase and Peter Jackson. They were strangers. She asked them to go to the cabin to tell Ben that his children were in the fodder house badly in need of food. She warned them not to let old Rit overhear what they said. John and Peter did exactly as she told them. She watched them knock on the ramshackle door of the cabin, saw the door open, saw old Ben standing in the doorway. The men motioned to him to come outside. They talked to him, Ben nodded his head. His expression did not change at all. She thought, how wonderful he is. Then he went back inside the cabin. Late in the afternoon, he tapped on the side of the fodder house and then opened the door and put part of that Christmas dinner, cooked bacon, hoe cake, fried pork, and roasted yams, inside on the floor. He did not look at them. He said, I know what'll come of this, and I ain't going to see my children know how. Harriet remembered his reputation for truthfulness. His word had always been accepted on the plantation because he was never known to tell a lie. She felt a kind of wondering admiration for him. He had become an old man in the five years since she had seen him, an old man. Yet the integrity and the strength of his character had not changed. How badly he must have wanted to see them, four of his children, there in the fodder house on Christmas Day. But he would not lie, and so he would not look at them. Thus, if he was questioned as to the whereabouts of his boys, he could say that he had not seen them. He made three trips from the cabin to the fodder house. Each time he put a small bundle of food inside the door until he must have given them most of the food intended for the Christmas dinner. Harriet noticed how slow his movements were. He was stooped over. He had aged fast. She would have to come back soon for him and old Rit, sometime very soon. She remembered his great strength and his love for the broad axe and the stories he used to tell her about the wonderful things to be seen in the woods. She wanted to put her arms around him and look deep into his eyes and didn't because she respected his right to make this self-sacrificing contribution to their safety. How he must have wanted to look at them, especially at the daughter whom he had not seen for five long years. They stayed in the fodder house all that day, lying on the top of the corn, listening to the drip of the rain, waiting for dark when they would set out. They spoke in whispers. Harriet kept reassuring them. They were perfectly safe. They would not be missed for at least two days. At Christmas, everyone was busy, dancing, laughing. The masters were entertaining their friends and relatives in their big, comfortable houses. The slaves were not required to work as long as the yule log burned in the fireplaces. She had never lost a passenger, never run her train off the track. They were safe with her. The Lord would see them through. She did not like this long, rainy day spent inside a fodder house, rain coming through the chinks in the boards. Dainty, pretty Catherine, who had been a house servant, complained bitterly. She objected to the rough feel of the corn. She said she thought she heard the sound of brass, a dry, scrabbling sound. 
Harriet laughed at her and told her this was easy, just sitting around like this, that the Underground Railroad wasn't any train ride. It meant walking and sometimes running and being hungry and sometimes jouncing up and down in the bottom of a farmer's wagon, but more walking than riding, rain or dry, through woods and swamps and briars and hiding anywhere that the earth offered a little shelter against prying eyes and listening ears. It meant not enough sleep because the walking had to be done at night and the sleeping during the day. Before the journey ended, Catherine would be able to sleep anywhere, on the ground, in a haystack, under a bush, and this rat-infested fodder house would loom in her memory like a king's palace. Catherine let out a scream and then burst into tears, and William Henry put his arm around her to comfort her. Harriet could not look at them. She turned her back on them, thinking not for her, ever, that soft light in the man's eyes. She looked through one of the chinks in the wall, looked toward the cabin. Every few minutes, old Rick came to the door, opened it, and looked out, hand shaking, shading her eyes, frowning, peering toward the road. Harriet thought, she's looking for the boys, wondering why William Henry and John and Benjamin haven't come, wondering what could have happened to them. The possibilities were infinite. They might have been sold south. They might have run away and been caught, might now be in chains. They might have kept going and been shot out of hand. Late in the afternoon, Ben made one more trip. He pushed another bundle of food inside the door. He kept his eyes closed, tight shut. He said he would be back when it got dark and would walk with them just a little way to visit with them. At dusk, Harriet left the fodder house. She moved quietly toward the cabin. She wanted to get a good look at her mother. The door was ajar. Old Rit was sitting in front of the fireplace, her head on her hand. The flickering light from the fire played over her. Harriet saw a little old woman rocking her body back and forth, sitting on her heels in front of the fire, sucking on a clay pipe as she grieved about her boys. Harriet wanted to say something to her, to offer some word of comfort, of greeting, and dared not for fear old Rit's uncontrolled joy or her loudly expressed fears would attract attention. When night came, Ben tapped on the door. He had tied a bandana tight around his eyes. Harriet took one of his arms, and one of the boys took him by the other arm. They started out walking slowly. Harriet answered Ben's questions as fast as she could. She told him a little about the other trips she had made, said that she would be back again to get him an old writ, told him where some of the people were that she had piloted north, what the north was like, cold in the winter, yes, but there were worse things in the world than cold. She told him about St. Catharines in Canada and said that she would be back soon. They parted from him reluctantly. Ben stood in the middle of the road, listening to the sound of their footsteps. They kept looking back at him. He did not remove the blindfold until he was certain they were out of sight. When he could hear no sound of movement, he untied the bandana and went back to the cabin. The next Monday, the brothers should have been on the plantations where they worked. By afternoon, their temporary masters, disturbed by their absence, sent messengers to Dr. Thompson in Caroline County asking about them. Dr. Thompson said, why, they generally come to see the house servants when they come home for Christmas, but this time they haven't been around at all. Better go down to old Ben's and ask him. They questioned old Rip first. She said, not one of them came this Christmas. I was looking for him all day, and my heart's most broke about him not coming. Ben said, I haven't seen one of them this Christmas. Meanwhile, Harriet led her group through the woods. Sometimes she ventured on the road, and they stumbled along behind her over the frozen ruts. Sometimes she took them through fields, sodden, gray. As they moved slowly north through Camden, Dover, Smyrna, Blackbird, she became aware of the heavy, brooding silence that hung over them. She told them about Thomas Garrett and the food and the warmth of the welcome that awaited them in Wilmington, and thought of the many different times she had invoked the image of the tall, powerfully built Quaker with his kind eyes to reassure herself as well as a group of runaways who stumbled along behind her. They stopped at a house in Middletown and spent the night and part of the day. Then they continued their journey on through Newcastle, down the Newcastle Road, until they reached the bank of the Christiana River. Across the river, cold and gray, in the dusk of a winter's night, lay Wilmington. Harriet waited until it was dark, and then she herded her party along over the bridge and then straight toward Thomas Garrett's house. Garrett fed them and hastily sent them on their way to Philadelphia that same night. The next day, Garrett wrote a letter to J. Miller McKim to let him know that this party of fugitives was on its way. William, Wilmington, 12th month, 29th, 1854. Esteemed friend, John Miller McKim. We made arrangements last night and sent away Harriet Tubman with six men and one woman 
to Alan Agnews to be forwarded across the country to the city. Harriet and one of the men had worn their shoes off their feet, and I gave them two dollars to help fit them out and directed a carriage to be hired at my expense to take them out, but do not yet know the expense. I have two more from the lowest county in Maryland on the peninsula, upwards of 100 miles. I will try to get one of our trusty colored men to take them tomorrow morning to the anti-slavery office. You can pass them on, Thomas Garrett. They arrived safely in the office of the Philadelphia Vigilance Committee on the 29th of December, late at night. William Steele wrote their names down in his record book under the heading, Moses Arrives with Six Passengers. He described Harriet as a woman of no pretensions, indeed, a more ordinary specimen of humanity could hardly be found among the most unfortunate-looking farms, farmhands of the South. Her success was wonderful. Time and again she made successful visits to Maryland on the Underground Railroad and would be absent for weeks at a time, running daily risks while making preparations for herself and passengers. Great fears were entertained for her safety, but she seemed wholly devoid of personal fear. The idea of being captured by slave hunters or slaveholders seemed never to enter her mind. He mentioned the sleeping seizures. Half of her time, she said she had the appearance of one asleep and would actually sit down by the roadside and go fast asleep when on her errands of mercy through the South. Before he described the passengers she had brought, he offered a theory as to the reason for her successful trips. It is obvious enough, however, that her success in going to Maryland as she did was attributable to her adventurous spirit and her utter disregard of consequences. Her like, her like it is probable, was never known before or since. As to the passengers, John Chase was 20 years old, chestnut color of spare build and smart. He said that his master, John Kimball Henry of Cambridge, Maryland, was a hard man and that he owned about 140 slaves. Benjamin Ross was described as 28 years of age, chestnut color, medium size, and shrewd. John Ross was only 22 and had left his wife, Harriet Ann, and two small children. Peter Jackson had been hired out to a farmer near Cambridge. Catherine, or Jane, was 22 and said her master was the worst man in the country. William Henry Ross was 35 years of age, of chestnut color, and well-made, and said that he had hardly been treated as well as a gentleman would treat a dumb brute. William still gave them advice on the subject of temperance, industry, education, etc. Clothing, food, and money were also given them to meet their wants, and they were sent on their way, rejoicing. After they left Philadelphia, they were guided to New York City and then on up through New York State, stopping at various stations on the underground route to Albany and Utica. They stayed with Reverend J.W. Logan in Syracuse and with Frederick Douglass in Rochester. As they went farther and farther west, it grew colder but the icy wind and the snow were only a prelude to the low temperatures they found in Canada. They arrived in St. Catharines, Canada West, early in January of 1855. Day after day, Harriet listened to all six of them, as all six of them complained bitterly about the cold that stung their faces, numbed their fingers, frosted their feet. Finally, one night when they were sitting huddled around the fire in the small house where she lived, she became impatient. It's warm in Maryland, nice and warm down there in the Tidewater country compared to here, she said. You want to go back there? They were startled into silence. She knew they were weighing this new freedom in the balance. Was it better to be warm and be a slave, or was it better to be cold and to be free? Then they said no in unison. Even Catherine, the delicate pretty girl who had been a house servant, said no. She did not want to go back, though she was shivering from the cold. Harriet poked the fire. It would have surprised me if you'd said yes. I've seen hundreds and hundreds of slaves who finally got to the north in freedom, but I never yet saw one who was willing to go back south and be a slave. She thought, freedom's a hard-bought thing, not bought with dust, but bought with all of oneself, the bones, the spirit, and the flesh, and once obtained, it had to be cherished, no matter what the cost. She would help these six people get adjusted to life in St. Catharines, and then in a few more months, she would go back to Maryland to help another group of slaves escape. Nothing would ever stop her from helping them, not masters or slave catchers or overseers or fugitive slave laws. If being cold is part of the price of being free, then we'll just have to pay it, she said, and sat up even straighter. We got to go free or die. Late in the summer of 1855, John Brown arrived in Kansas with a wagon load of arms and ammunition. Four of his sons had taken up land there in October 1854. 
It was obvious from the letters he had received from them that the Kansas troubles would have to be settled with guns. Brown was 56 years old, his hair was gray, his shoulders were stooped. Men already spoke of him as old John Brown.